Hello, my name is Dennis Daly and I'm an interviewer for the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamilton County. And today I have the honor of interviewing Mr. Maurice Adams on April 23rd, 2007 at the Main Library. And our camera operator today is Leanne McNabb. Mr. Adams, thank you very much for doing this interview. Pleasure to be here. And uh, we were talking a little bit off camera, but I thought we'd start. Uh, where were you born, sir? Uh, New York City. New York City? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and tell us a little bit about what you did before you joined the, uh, before you were drafted the first time during World War II. Well, yeah, I went to school in, in Hall, uh, PS5, then to junior high school, 139. And then I went to um, D with Clinton, which was located in the Bronx. And basically, it was uh, basically a Jewish school because of the neighborhood and whatnot. And uh, when I graduated from uh, Clinton, then I went to the military. And that was uh, June of 45. And um, you mentioned that it was mostly a Jewish school. So New York City public schools were pretty much fully integrated by the time you uh, The public schools, talking about the grade schools uh, and junior high schools were you had that within Harlem. Okay. The high schools were located outside of Harlem, see, and those were integrated, and they had some mechanism, I guess, to decide who went where. You had your choice. You okay. might have one or two choices, but I found that it's actually where you were located, see. And uh, I think I, I wanted to go to Clinton, but someone told me I was out of the district. And one day, a friend of my father's, a Jewish fellow who ran a furniture store, came by the house, and he asked me, where was I going? He said, I said, well, I guess Commerce or Seward Park. He said, why don't you go to a good school like Clinton? I said, I'm out the district. And he said, come here. And he pointed across the window. He said, if you lived on that side of the street, you'd be out the district. You're right on the borders. I said, OK. So I went to Clinton. And uh, did you have a good experience there? Did you? It was nice, yeah. yeah. Um, I graduated about four years later, not the regular three. I had a pretty good, it was a good academic school. And I had to spend an extra year. Okay. Uh, and then uh, you graduated in 45. Right, and went right into the Uncle Sam called you up. And That's right. Um, so tell me a little bit about, now I'm really fascinated with your story, we'll get to a little bit later on, but when you went in, the Army was still segregated. That's right. Uh, tell me a little bit about what you did uh, for basic training, where you were sent in this experience. Uh, they, well, initially I went into Fort Dix, and then from Fort Dix I went to Camp Crowder, Missouri, and that's where I took uh, basic training. And uh, one of the first thing I noticed, uh, it was segregated, of course, uh, the white soldiers were living in the nice green and white barracks. Uh, we were living in the old uh, CCC camp barracks, which was one low building with, uh, uh, you, it was heated internally with three big pot bellied stoves. You put coal in there and whatnot. Latrines was outside. That was a separate building. So that was the first thing I noticed. The second thing I noticed is that uh, we were wearing old uniforms, the old leggings, not the boots. And we were trained with the 03 rifles and not the M1 rifle. In 45 you were still wearing That's them? right. We, wow. were, we were training with, with those. And uh, when basic was over, they said, well, now you're going to go to uh, basic medical training in um, Brook General Hospital, Fort, Fort Sam Houston. Okay, that's in Texas. That's where I went, and I was trained as a surgical technician. And uh, when I got out, uh, I think we got out somewhere around March. And they didn't know where to send us. And later on, I found out uh, what may have been the problem. Uh, you know, they had planned for an invasion of Japan. The first one was to be in September. The second one was to be uh, around March. And I think this is where the holdup was. The war was over, and they didn't quite know where to send us. See. 
And finally, um, they said that now surgical technicians, you're supposed to, you had about four or five in the general hospital. And there were quite a few of us, all black, were trained as surgical technicians. And we got an assignment. My assignment was Springfield General Hospital, Missouri. Others got assigned other places throughout the country. So while we were on the train, we were going to these various places because we were initially on one train before we split up. We got word that all of us were going to Fort Francis E. Warren, Wyoming, because evidently the entire uh, medical unit was being discharged. So now they're putting us all surgical check districts together to go into um, uh, the station hospital. Now, they only got room for a couple of surgical technicians at the station hospital, so that meant most of us were going to be ward boys, et cetera, et cetera. I think the two oldest uh, among us were surgical technicians. They made them surgical technicians and made a couple of other sent to different clinics, like dental clinic, now lined up in supply. But what was so funny after they did this, now we're all one bunch now. When we arrived at Fort Francis E. Warren, they mistook us for uh, replacements for training for truck drivers. Didn't even look at our orders. She said, you guys are going to be truck drivers. I said, oh, shit, so We stayed up one night in the day room. And that's where we slept until they can get organized. Woke up the next morning, and there was the colonel from the hospital. Oh, he was giving these quartermaster people the devil and stole my men. They're supposed to, we didn't have any orders, you know, they're supposed to come and might attach them. So we were glad, so we went over to um, medical detention. So, so these uh, guys that first saw you, they were just going based on the fact that you were African American? That's right, that we were quartermaster replacements. You were the truck drivers. And they couldn't understand that we were actually replacing the whole uh, medical unit. But a lot of us wound up as, uh, on the wards, others, like I mentioned, clinics, and a few others, like myself, in supply. Uh, also, at, at that post, Fort Francis E. Warren, the MPs there were black. There was a black detachment there. So we worked pretty good together. If we needed to go someplace, like in the town, and it's raining or whatnot, they saw we got the town. Or they'd call us and say, hey, Sergeant So-and-so is coming to the hospital. You take care of it. So we take care of it. <laughs> in first class treatment. <laughs> so that's the way it worked there. Um, Going back a little bit, uh, when you went to Missouri to mm -hmm. do basic training, had, was that the first time that you had sort of lived or been outside of New York City? Or had yes, you, yes. Um, what, what did you notice? Did you have much dealings with the town uh, that was around you? Like Just you once uh, when I three of us walked around the town and uh, somebody said, well, let's go to the movies. So I walked up to the cashier, you know, and gave him my money. So politely smiled at me and said, we don't save color, we don't serve color. Wow. Around. And the fellows behind me were laughing because they set me up. Okay. They set me up there purposely for that seat. And uh, yeah, that's what I noticed there. Because you know, you went to, to Texas after that, mm -hmm. um, uh, but that was really the only kind of experience you had like that in terms of going into southern towns yeah, or just sort of and, and to stay away from them. After you go, okay. So you're up in Wyoming. Uh, were you were you there until you were discharged the first time? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that would have been in '46. Uh, yeah, '46. Okay. Uh, how long? What do you remember? What time? For, at what point in '46 you actually got discharged? Uh, that was. Oh yes. Um, in when I first went in, just to back up a little, we didn't know how long we were going to stay in. And that's when the Army had a field day in getting people to re-up. Because you were here and think, well, you're going to be in here five years. And someone will say, well, if you re-up for three years, they put you on a 90-day leave home. Whoopee. And you know, if you sign up for a year and a half, you get 60 days home. See? And some people fell for it. Uh, myself, we didn't fall for it. So by the summer of 46, we were told that all go 
those who were drafted in 45 would be out by Christmas of 46. Okay. So I said, oh, we'll be. And then one day in October, I'm in supply room, line up supplies, and the sergeant came to me and he said, you're going home next week. I said, home next week? What are you talking about? He said, discharge. And this is in October. So I said, oh, whoopee. And um, what they, they gave us a release paper. And all it had said, uh, you would be, you get your discharge November 15th around this day. This is in October. I forgot this. Second week in October. So I went home. I didn't tell my parents I was coming home. I, I, I'm going to surprise them. So I got home in Holland, knocked on the door. <laughs> my mother had answered the door and she looked at me in surprise. I said, Mom, I'm home. So she opened the door and looked at me and she started closing. She says, You're home? What, they discharge you? I said, Yes. She said, Let me see your discharge paper. I said, well, Mom, I, got, uh, I gave her my release paper. And I, she said, this is not a discharge paper. I said, Mother, this is what they gave me. I was supposed to get my discharge paper all so and so. She looked at it, and she noticed it says, this on the headquarters phone number. She said, you stay right here. And she went inside <laughs> the bedroom, got on the phone, and called the Fifth Army duty officer. So they talked for a while. And I guess he explained to her, he says, he told her what was happening and that I would have a release paper and so forth and it gives them when I get discharged. So she came back and she said, come on in. And she kissed me and she called everybody to tell me I was home. I found out at that time one of the reasons a lot of guys were, at that time, were coming home, period. <laughs> you know, they got discharged and that, they came <laughs> home, so she thought I was one of those. I thought you were AWOL? Yeah, I thought I was AWOL. So. <laughs> So, so world, the World War II experience is over for you now. You're back in New York, yeah. um, and uh, from there you went to Syracuse. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, on the GI Bill, and you were talking to me about that uh, a little bit earlier. Explain what happened there. You you went in for three years. To Syracuse. Uh, well, what had happened? I had uh, uh, only had three years. Initially, I went to um, the junior college, upstate New York. See before I went to Syracuse. And when I went to Syracuse, that was my um, junior year. See. So now I'm trying to decide uh, how my mother and I know my father going to work hard so I could get the uh, tuition uh, for, the, for the next year and so forth. And this is because you, you had the GI Bill up to three years, years based on how long you had served. That's right. Okay. So, uh, and Fred trying to figure out, I got to have another sort of income, see. I decided that I was going to work uh, in the cafeteria for, for the girls, that big cafeteria. I could eat there, I'd take care of that, and I got to find some place where I'm going to stay. And most of the places there, you had to pay about $20 or so a month. And somebody said, well, why don't you join the ROTC? And I said, it's too late for that because I thought that was strictly a four-year program. Sure. They said, no, you're in World War II. They said, well, you can go in right after junior year. I said, oh. And I said, well, why should I go there? So well, they pay twenty-one seventy a month. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll go. <laughs> so that's how I got into the ROTC program. Yeah. And you finished up your last year at Syracuse? Yeah, the yeah, last two years. In the ROTC? And, and then what happened? Uh, then, of course, I got called um, um, to active duty. And uh, I had to go to Benning. And uh, Benning, that's where I took my basic training. And then from Benning, I had to go, uh, oh, I was assigned to the uh, 9th Division that was in Fort Dix. And I stayed there for a couple of years, and then I had to go back to Benning for motorized infantry training, and then from there I went on to Korea, where okay. the war was winding down. And now, just a quick question: So you had to go through basic training a second time? No. Well, no. The, the basic training you, that you have to go in as a second lieutenant. Okay. That's one, but then I had to get further training and they were sending me to motorized infantry school or something. Okay. So I had to go to Benny. Yeah. 
Now, did you, now, by this time, the Army had been integrated. Right. So your second hitch in the Army here, you're coming into an integrated Army. Did you notice, I mean, obviously, you were bunking with, with white soldiers, and uh, was, did you notice any kind of animosity? Uh, no, not that, not that much there. Uh, uh, at the training camp, uh, you noticed a little bit there, but uh, nothing that <laughs> that you couldn't handle. Sure, so I would say. Now, when I joined the unit overseas, uh, there was only one other black officer in the whole battalion, and I was in. Uh, Easy Company, and he was in G Company. His name was Hardy. Um, and uh, my commanding officer was Cavazos. Uh, he was he was a lieutenant, I believe, yeah, first lieutenant. And if you recall, there was a Cavazos who was uh, in the Reagan administration. I think he was Secretary of Education. Well, this Kavasis was his brother. Okay. And this Kavasis went on to be the first four-star Mex Mexican-American general. Okay. So, and uh, he got that. When I had joined the unit, they had just, let me see, uh, they had just about been decimated. It was something like uh, they hit 421, Hill 421, with 105 men, and they wound up 35 killed, 70 wounded. And Kavasas got the Distinguished Service Cross, so he was on his way up. Uh, when the war had ended, it was a funny thing. They stopped the pipeline for officers. In other words, they weren't getting no more officers. But, in, but the enlisted men were piling up. So, for example, if you had a battalion that had that called for 800 men and 16 or 32 officers, 32 officers and 800 men, the battalion was now 1,600 men and 16 officers. So you just cut it in half. Yeah. And uh, like Harding, he was the only officer in, in G Company besides Captain. I was the only officer besides Kavasas and another officer who was just being rotated, but we weren't getting any replacements in. So that's how we were structured. And uh, so you got there after the ceasefire? The yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just right after the ceasefire. And how long did you spend in Korea? Hmm? How long did you spend in Korea? Uh, about. Well, they said 15 months. Yeah, it, it was 15 months because in the following, see, I got the following October, um, I was supposed to re rotate back home in January. See. And uh, a unit, the second division, not the second division, I think it was, yeah, your second division was going home. And uh, they had to have a certain amount of men, something like, I forgot how many officers, 50 officers and a whole bunch of men and whatnot, see. And they called me one day, and uh, this, was, this was in September, and we knew the unit was going to go home in October. So I'm not thinking about going home until January. Mm -hmm. And someone <laughs> called me and said, uh, at that time, I was working on staff. I was G1, I was the S1 and S2. We didn't have that many officers, I had the two slots. So, someone said, Adam says, you got here September 2nd, didn't you? Something like that. I said, no, I think it was September 3rd. He said, no, are you sure it wasn't September 2nd? I said, well, what's the difference? He said, well, they need another officer to go back with the division if he was came there September 2nd. So I said, oh yeah. He said, oh, I thought so. <laughs> so that's how I came back in October instead of January. This, when was this 53, 52? Yeah, this is, this is uh, uh, 54, uh, 54. Uh, 54 now. Okay. So that's how I got home. 
And that was an interesting trip. We, uh, by ship, we had the second division going home. When I say second division, so many men and so many officers. And East Coast rotating unit, there were people that were rotating out. They were on the ship. And then we had uh, the Colombian Army contingent. And they were going to Colombia, going to Ventura. So we took off, I can't remember the exact date, but it looked like it was the rest of October, all of November. We didn't get to New Orleans till in December. I never did all the boat. He came in through New Orleans. Oh, that's an interesting thing. Yeah. came to boat. The funniest thing is when we uh, landed in Hawaii. The enlisted men were allowed to go into Hawaii off the ship in civilian clothing. Officers had to be in their dress, dress uniform. And we got in there and a bunch of us officers and this one we learned you can rent a car. I never heard about this renting a car. So somebody says, well, who got a license? I said, I got a license. I said, oh, so well, you rent the car. So you got in the car and I rented the car. And I'm driving around and I noticed people in Hawaii, skimply clad, and they said, ooh, whoopee, man, they walked across the street and I almost hit somebody. And they were on a crosswalk. I never seen a crosswalk before, see. And finally a police car came by and stopped me. <laughs> so the guy said, what did you do? I said, I've been driving 20 miles an hour, I don't know what I did. So they said, the cops said, well, you didn't observe the people crossing the crosswalk. I said, oh, is that what's, what it was? See, because they were in bathing suits, so I got a tip for that. <laughs> so, um, uh, and that was the first experience. Second experience is that I passed the hotel, and it showed that the ink spots at that time, favorite, you no know, singing sure. they were there. And I said, while I was in Korea, um, I was the escort officer, see, and uh, I said, well, I'm waking them up, so I, I knock on the door, they didn't know who it was, and uh, I told them that they were happy to see me, see, but they wanted me to stay that night, and I couldn't stay that night, see, hmm. because uh, we had to go back. Uh, then we got, went to Bono Ventura. And on our way to Bonaventura, that was an interesting trip. Uh, just before we got into port, the enlisted men were getting in the Colombian unit, were getting paid for the first time. And they were paying them in the, what we call the officer's uh, section, you know, our, where we have play cards and whatnot. So G.I. Joe was outside looking. And these guys hadn't been paid, I guess, while they were in Korea. And they were drawing something like $5,000 each in American money. So what was going on, unknown to us, we learned this later. G.I. Joe freaking boy, he's going to organize some games. See? So when these guys came out on that night, there was all kind of games all over the ship to help the Colombians spend their money, see. <laughs> and i never forget that, that was... Ice games. Oh, I'd be going up a stairwell and the American GIs being chased with a city by somebody in Spanish and whatnot. I said, oh God, what's going on? They had all kind of fake games and whatnot, see. So that night was interesting. Next morning, uh, the officers are in the officer's section and they're playing cards. And one of the Bonaventura, uh, one of the Columbia soldiers comes into the officer's section. He knows this guy coming in here. He think he's looking for the Colombian officers. But he comes right to the table and there was a Colonel Beck. He was basically our commanding officer and whatnot. And he walked up to Colonel Beck and he says, uh, Key, Colonel Beck, you need a key. Beck looked at him. <laughs> we were talking about 
the other officers would say, we don't know what he's talking about. And this guy's getting real fast break. Key, key, key. Finally, Beck said, wait, you better call one of these Colombian officers. They call a Colombian officer, and Colombian officer comes in and explains what happened. He says, oh, he says, uh, on the ship, the first time I've ever seen it, we had these Pepsi Cola machines, see, and that was operating like crazy. When you drop a quarter in there and get a pop and whatnot. Some GI had sold this machine <laughs> to the soldier here for, I guess, $100 or $200. I told him to go and get the key from Colonel Beck. So that was the problem, <laughs> see. And he lined up the soldiers and couldn't find, you know, who did it. So now we're going into going to Ventura for the first time. And I noticed well, everybody is at the dock. And I come into the dock and I looked and I said, I'd be doggone. And it dawned on me. Now this is South America. Only experience I had with South America is at the movies. And all you saw at the movies from South America with Desi Arnaz. Exhibit the Chuga, and who's the Brazilian one, the common Miranda. Miranda. And I looked at the people that was on the dock there, and I thought I was in Africa. And this was Columbia. <laughs> so anyway, we landed. And just before we landed, on the top deck, the bells was ringing. The MPs were running around, chasing this. Colombian soldier, and they ran him down, and what happened? GI got a hold of him and sold one of the lifeboats on top for about a couple hundred dollars and told them when they land, you go up and get your boat. <laughs> so the poor guy went up there, which is off limits, and I guess knocked on the pilot ship and wanted to get his boat, and he paid for it, and they weren't going to give him nothing, he was going to get his boat, so they had to call the MPs. <laughs> oh, man. So, so, yeah. so, so that was very interesting there. And then later on, I went into Bonaventure and I uh, ran into police chief, a young fella, and he drove me around. He was my complex and he took me all the places around there. So, so that was my experience in South America, minus Kugat and Desi Arnaz. <laughs> hey, did you go through the canal then? Yes, went the canal. That was a long trip. And then we landed in New Orleans, and from New Orleans, uh, I think yeah, that's when I got off, and uh, uh, I think I took a plane from there to uh, Newark Airport. Okay. That. But when we landed in New Orleans, we had a parade. They had a parade there. So we had to go out and parade, and I remember when we, I guess the first time they saw an integrated unit, but they didn't make any harsh comments except by when I was marching along. The lady looked down and said, next time they come through here, shine your shoes. <laughs> so those were, were, not, were not that spick, spick um, and, uh, and span uh, shine on them. And uh, then I went into, I forgot there's an army post there, and that's where we went in to turn in our clothes and go to the next unit. Now I was assigned to the unit out in Fort Lewis, that was the, uh, 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 yeah, that was the 2nd Division in Fort Lewis. So I remember going there and they said, well, I had these winter clothes that we had in Korea, and you so said, you can turn these in. I said, look, I'm going to Fort Lewis. I said, I'm going to keep all the winter clothes. I, I never been to Fort Lewis. All I knew it was near Washington, and Washington was near Alaska, so I want to have all the with the clothing I could, see. And then I, then I took a flight into Newark Airport, and Newark Airport took a bus into New York, and so forth. And we were just on leave at this point? Yeah, you? yeah, I was on leave. When you, were, when you joined the ROTC, um, had you decided to make a career out of the Army at this point? Uh, yes, I decided. At, at that time, when I decided that I was uh, going to make you know, Army my career, I was thinking my ambition was, I said, well, if I make an army, I probably, uh, even though it was integrated, I didn't think that far ahead. And I was saying, well, if I can make 20 years, it might make major, because 
I, when I decided that Korean War hadn't started, mm -hmm. and I'm going from past history, I said, we have a war every 20 years. So I said, well, I'll make, uh, quit 20 years, get out, cheat, and uh, now I'll have two incomes. See, and when I retire, I got two incomes. And if I get married, my wife will probably be working too soon. Well, it worked out that way. Okay. It uh, actually worked out because my wife, uh, when I did get married, she became a teacher. She had a master's and everything worked out fine. See. Of course, I did retire as, as a lieutenant colonel. But at that time, when you looked at money, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> Tuition at Syracuse at that time was six hundred dollars a semester. It went up to seven sixty my last semester. The kids almost tore the school down. So. But you know it's a big change. Sure. And I remember when we were in Korea. Uh, yeah, we were going home. You know, we were going home. We had called on. I had called on the black officers that I knew in the unit. It was only a few. And we go on the hill and drink beer and whatnot and ask the guys what they're going to do when they get out. The guy said, well, I'm going to go to law school and uh, when I get out, I'm going to make $10,000 a year. And he said, whoopee, whoopee, whoopee. And he asked other guys what they're going to do. And they said, they're going to make $50,000. I said, man, that's good. You guys staying in what you're going to make. Well, when I retire, I probably make about $6,500. Oh, man, that's, that's good. See. And there was a General McLean, the white, but he was, he was pretty fair to us. And he was, um, he was getting out. I think his name was McLean, something like that. He was a brigadier, a general. We said, what, what, what's, what's going to be his salary? Somebody figured it out. Oh, he would be making $18,000 a year. He said, oh, man. <laughs> and when we look back now, you got to laugh and find out what 18,000 or 6,000 would get you. And uh, also, I had put away money for my first daughter for college. And like I said, when I left, you don't know what's going on outside. See, I was tuition went to 760, 760, that's about what, uh, uh, about 1,500 a, a year <laughs> when I got out. I called Syracuse and uh, I asked them to wish me. And it was 4320. And I said, well, good, I got 4,500. They said, no, 4320 for one year. So she didn't go to Syracuse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you got back to the States and you went to uh, Washington. Yeah. In 54. Uh, and uh, then what did you do in between? I know that you actually did a couple of tours in Vietnam as well. Well, in Washington, what we didn't know, the Army don't tell you anything to tell the high ranking officers. Being an infantry officer, you expect to at least move every two or three years. After the third year, we're still there. Come to find out, uh, we spent something like five, five and a half years there. That officers coming from career, their recent combat tour, would have been anywhere from five to six years back in the States. Okay. So that's why. Uh, so I didn't leave until, say, I went there in 55 and uh, left in 60. I went to Germany. Okay. And before I went to Germany, I went back to Benning for advanced infantry training. And then I uh, went to Germany. And I was with the family. I had a wife and three kids. Okay. And I was assigned to Stuttgart Post. And I became first assistant headquarters commandant and then headquarters commandant for my rest of my tour there, three year mm -hmm. tour. How long was it, three years? It was, it was three years. Okay, three years. Uh, came back right after Kennedy was killed. Okay. Came In fact, sense. when he was killed, I was going up to. Uh, Grandma Harbor, you see when you, if you have a car, before you leave Germany, you have to take your car for about two weeks before you leave, so that your car would get back, I mean, would be there when you get, get to, you know, back to the States. Okay. Uh, not necessarily, but it would be there in a few days. Sure. 
And if you're coming, if you just arrived in Germany, you have to wait two weeks to go and get your car. But at this time, a good friend of mine uh, had just arrived in Germany. And I called him, I said, your car is ready up in Germany? He said, yes. I said, well, I got to take mine up soon. You come with me, we go and get his car come back. And uh, he later uh, became two-star general. He was from Dallas, Texas. And on our way back, this was June 20, this was December 22nd, we decided to stop in Mannheim, which was halfway back from Mannheim, from Brennan, Mannheim, and then Stuttgart. He said, let's stop over and see a friend of ours who was stationed there. He said, okay. And then we could go out that night. And we stopped by, and the friend of ours went by his quarters. His wife was there. But he was still on duty. She said, well, he's working. And uh, we said, well, we wait. So we turned on the radio. Back to we listened to music. We weren't care for any news. And we were talking. And mm -hmm. finally, he came in later that evening. It was in the evening. And uh, he said, did you hear the news? I said, what news? He says, uh, uh, Kennedy was shot. And he said, what? So we said, well, let's turn on the radio. We turned on the radio. and. Uh, all we could get was commercial. This was, they had the Armed Forces Network mm -hmm. operating out of Berlin. I said, if the president got shot, nobody have a commercial. So they said, and now we turn you back to Washington, D.C. I said, oh. And as soon as he turned back, it was uh, Walter Cronkite and said, now nah, the president has just died. He just, oof. And, uh, my buddy who I was with was from Dallas. I said, well, I can't tell nobody I'm from Dallas. <laughs> so that night we decided, well, we'll still go out and see what happens. So we went to a few places. Some places, the people were in the morning. Some places, it was open just like it was anything happened. Run into a few American officers, and they were sitting down, looking sad, and patting them on the shoulder. And then uh, next day, I got back to Stuttgart, got right back to the post. There's my Jeep, there's my driver and his full gear. I said, what's going on? Well, you heard the president got killed. I said, yeah. I said, so what? So, you know, <laughs> where are we going? <laughs> Everybody going on position. They think the Russians are coming. I said, oh. <laughs> so uh, that's what we did. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Everybody figured the Russians are coming now. <laughs> see, see. So, something you kind of forget about with the yeah. Cold War being over for about 15 years now, but yeah, they thought the Russians were going to take advantage of that, huh? mm. cross over. And... So, uh, so then you came back to the States. Right, I came back to the States. That was in, uh, let me see, I'm going to come, oh, I came back uh, to the States and I was assigned to Fort Ord, the U.S. Combat Experimentation Center. That's where they conduct experiments and so forth. And I got promoted to major in 64. And I was assigned as chief controller of one of the experiments. And the experiment was titled U.S. Aircraft Survivability Experiment. That was the title. It was actually trying to get information on how to develop tactics for all the aircraft flying over a Soviet recognized regiment. Because Soviet recognized regiment had Boku anti aircraft guns. And that's what it was about. I don't know the results of it. All I know, I was told by the general in charge, and he patted me on the back and gave me a big uh, achievement award. He said the data they got was what they needed to determine what they're going to so I don't know <laughs> what the tactics were, sure. but they got the data that they knew. See. And uh, at that time, we got people that came in from the Department of the Army talking about our future, and we heard grumblings about Vietnam. Well, the Army's always a year two behind, so 
so they were talking about like people like myself. You guys can get out in 20 years, so that means you're getting out in 70. Don't look forward to no more promotion, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. And then, of course, <laughs> 65 come, and I'm mowing the lawn, and someone, my wife calls me and says, there's someone from the Department of Army who wants to speak to you. And it was a clerk, told him to be ready. I'm going to go to Vietnam within a certain period. I'll get orders to go to uh, special warfare school in uh, North Carolina, and that was my introduction. This this is right when hmm? this is right when Johnson escalated the war. Sixty five was yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a, that's right. So you were you were taken right that, away. That's right, see, and uh, so that's when I went and I joined the U.S. Military Assistant Command, and uh, we were assigned to the Vietnamese Fifth Division initially as G1 advisor. And uh, we got them here around Thanksgiving. And they had four regiments. Seventh regiment was up near a place called um, Michelin Plantation, with a big rubber plantation. And they were about to uh, go on a campaign out there. And I remember sitting down with uh, the officers myself and whatnot. I was to follow after the officers went up there that night, and I was to follow possibly with the, uh, uh, in case they ran into trouble, with the unit to go up there, see. And anyway, uh, they went that night, you know, after Thanksgiving, they went up there. And then the next day, we listened to the radios, and uh, Colonel called me in and said, uh, the seventh been ambushed around Michigan. And they're trying to find out what's going on and getting their reports and who to send up there. And finally, he said, we have to go up. Time I got up there, the battle was over, and the unit had 600 casualties 200 killed, 200 wounded, 200 missing around that number. And all the officers except one were still alive. And all the officers were still alive? Mm -hmm. They were still alive? Yeah. Okay. And the, uh, what unit uh, uh, was still in contact, the reason why they wasn't complete wipeout, because there was one unit that that night when they were bivouac took a defense position. One of the advisors noted See, how the Vietnamese, see, they don't have a mess hall and whatnot, see. You carry the pans, I carry the food, and we sit down and we eat, see. So you're eating and nobody setting up no defensive position, see. And one of the advisors of one battalion decided to set up a, a, a defensive position. And that was the one unit that divides, mm -hmm. survived and whatnot. So, uh, so this was, these were, this was the South Vietnamese you yeah. were attached to? Yeah, so anyway, when I went up after everything was over with, uh, we had to send in reinforcements, and I had to set up uh, help. Well, I had to find out where the VC was, if they were still in the unit, so you can call in reinforcements and all that. So after that was decided uh, uh, that we pretty well knew the VC were gone, now we could set defense position and then we bring in reinforcements and that was an eye opener. Reinforcements were coming in and uh, they were lining up and I was with them when they sent this unit here, join that unit. And the first thing I noticed, so they were lining up and right behind them was I guess their wife and their baby. And I'm looking, I said, what in the heck is this? Somebody told me, he says, well, you know, in the Vietnamese the Army, they don't have any place for the families to stay. So they come with the trip. I said, what am I going to do with this thing? <laughs> and child, with the soldier. So they say, left face, and everybody left face, and, and the wife and baby do a sharp left face. And they march off away, and they go into a defensive position. And I said, oh, my God. And the wife, the wife and the kids went out in the field? That's right. <laughs> wow. And I noticed after that, when I did take over a regiment, and we would have, we'd be at a base, and like say, place that Ben Cap, 
And if we go out, let's say, on a mission, some other area is in trouble and whatnot, if we stay, let's say, longer than a week, I'll notice in our defensive position, families moving up, either by foot or by bus, they'll actually move up. Like one day, I'm going through a defensive position, I go through a machine gun, and I see hanging near the machine gun a clothesline with some diapers, and I'm looking, and I look at the end of the gun, and there's mother with the baby and a hand on the gun, and her husband there taking a nap. Yeah, they would eventually, because they have no place to stay, you know, I mean, they'd stay at that where we were. Right. But there's no facilities, and if the husband doesn't come, they don't know where he's at. But we go out there with him. And that's what we do. They right. be right on defensive position with him. They have no, uh, you know, no place for them. Wow. And uh, another problem we found out with the Vietnamese unit, uh, let's say I send a report to Saigon that the unit right now would be going to hit the field and have something like 297 men. And after I check with my captain advisors and all the units, they say, how, how many people you got? Okay, you're going to hit the field and put down 297. Uh, my counterpart with the Vietnamese unit uh, will put down a large number. See? And the guys up at headquarters will get my 297, and they'll check with their Vietnamese counterpart. Uh, says 400. See, and so Adams, you're wrong. See? We go into combat, and uh, we might get beat up. And I'll get a call from the American advisors. I say, Adams, how come you're getting beat up by a Viet Cong unit that has maybe about 400 men? I said, didn't you see what I gave you? Well, you said 297, but the Vietnamese, I said, did you see what I gave you? Okay, well, now you understand why we're getting beat up. But why the difference? I said, the difference is very simple. I said, we make a head count. What the Vietnamese is going by is what's on the TO menu, what's on paper, what they're supposed to have. And we, we go out by headcount. But why the difference? Very simple. I says the Vietnamese soldier, he has no one to take care of his family. He goes to his company commander and talks with his company commander and says, you let me go back to Saigon and take care of my family. And when payday comes, you take my money. Because it's the captain who signs the payroll, not the enlisted man. Okay. So I said, yeah, go home. So that's why we got 297 men instead of 400 men. Because they're back in Saigon after this captain has signed in. And I told you that, but the people just believe what the Vietnamese tell you. So they said, oh, I said, that's what we're going through. So that was one of the things you have to go through with the Vietnamese Army. Twelve minutes. Oh, okay, great. So, uh, so in your first tour, were you uh, always attached to the Vietnamese unit, or did you get? Well, after, after that, uh, they rotated me, and I uh, uh, I went to um, the province. We had that province advisors. You know, province is like a state. Mm -hmm. and the province had a group of troops and whatnot. So I went, in my last tour, I was with advisor to Benzoom Province. Okay. And that was, that was it. This was, uh, so th there was a time in between your two tours, correct, that you came back to the States, or? Oh, yeah. Uh, I came back to the States and went straight to University of Cincinnati. And that's how you ended up in Cincinnati? That's right. Okay. And uh, I, um, I didn't ask for Cincinnati, but uh, well, I found out later what, what had happened. But anyway, when I got here, and uh, I thought this was a southern city. Uh, my, one of my first experiences when I came here was um, 
On our car, you had a big letter A, which said faculty. And you could drive, when you came in for a basketball game, you go to a certain parking lot with that A. If you don't have that A, you talk with everybody else. So I came in with my big A sticker on there, and the policeman told me to go this way instead of going to the left. So I stopped, and I called him. And he came in, the big A sticker is on the front of the car. And he comes right up his face there. He said, what's the problem? I said, who goes to the right, who goes to the left? And he told me who goes to the right, and what do I have to have to go to the left? A sticker, he has to have an A sticker. So I said, what in the blankety blank is that in front of you? And he did a double take. And he did like that. So I told him, I'm assigned to the school here. I said, and uh, I expect better treatment. You know, I said, that son of a gun saw my black face before he saw the A sticker. So he saw my, look, you gotta go over here. So I said, well, welcome to Cincinnati. So I had another incident where I had a class. I, wondered, I guess I was a little bit late. And the professor instead of knocking on the door and saying, look, he bust right into my classroom and told me I had to leave. I said, you get out of here and knock you right on your ass. So he left and I figured, boy, that's it. So I went to see the colonel. And he <laughs> smiled and I got there. He said, yes, so I told him. But I took problem. And then I said, why in the damn? I said, did, did you have any uh, reason why I'm here? He said, yes. He said, then why did you pick me? He says, it was time Cincinnati saw a black combat officer going about your business. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that uh, uh, professor reported. And it was so funny, around the post, around Cincinnati, they had four places where you might have to show identification. I'd have to show nothing when I was in uniform or nothing. As soon as I drive up, somebody said, how you doing, nature? And that's all I'm school. So I said, what kind of damn place is this? And I found out this was still, <laughs> I called it crack land. <laughs> oh, my God. So, uh, yeah, that was when I introduced to Cincinnati. Uh, and you were teaching at the university, uh, so, so what, was it uh, the Army ROTC? ROTC. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you got word that you were going to be going back to uh, Vietnam? Yeah, yeah. In other words, I was supposed to retire. Uh, I got here in, uh, uh, when was that? That was December 66. I actually got here January 2nd, 1967. Okay. And from that year, up until this date, I spent at least part of each year in Cincinnati. Okay. So um, I was going to go back to, uh, uh, no, so I was going to retire in 70 until I got the word what I told you about before. I, I'd have to go back if no. In other words, uh, I did go back. And I went back to Vietnam, and that was in 70, November. Of 70, I came back in 71, and then I got assigned to the um, military intelligence school and center in Fort Huachuca. Okay. My, job, my job there was chief of the tactical division up until I retired. Yeah. And you retired as a lieutenant colonel? Right, and they gave me the Legion of Merit for reorganizing and restructuring the intelligence school, there's tactics and all. See. Well, sir, uh, I think we're probably going to have to have you back again when we start interviewing Vietnam veterans. Okay. And Korean veterans, is this, uh, I mean, this is just a fascinating career, and uh, I think we just kind of hit the tip of the iceberg here, but we thank you for doing the interview. Thank you. Thanks for everything you've done for the country, and uh, that's, that's it. That's it.